Um, so what am I going to talk about? Actually, a lot has been said already about what I'm going to talk about, but um, that isn't going to keep me from saying it again. Um, it, what I'm going to talk about is if you go down the evidence-based uh, path in your department, um, how are you going to get science to work for your organization? Um, and you've already heard a bit about this from people who've actually been trying it to do it, um, um, people who are involved in it. Uh, I want to get into the weeds sort of of management issues. And, and it's, I'm mindful that it's sort of presumptuous of me to do that in as much as I have that much experience managing police organizations. Uh, I have managed academic organizations. They're much harder to manage, by the way, I, I gather. But uh, in any in any way, um, so I have neither experience nor do I have science. There really isn't a lot of evidence on evidence-based policing. So what I this is going to be is an exercise in speculation-based policing. Um, so. I'm not going to go into this in great depth because Cynthia already talked about it, but essentially evidence-based policing is, is about two things. First, finding out what strategies and practices are best for the, the police to adopt, and then figuring out also which individuals, units, and departments are doing the best job. Now, the evidence-based movement proposes to make science a major influence, if not the major influence, in doing these things. Um, it's fair to say, I think, that in most police departments, science is not currently what dominates most aspects of police decision making in America. There are other influences that play, I think, a more dominant role, and here they are. And because these have been talked about at some length before, I'm not going to, to go into them in great depth except that Kraft refers, we often think of as what the practitioners on the street are doing, and that's based on experience, personal experience. Professional traditions come out of essentially prestigious um, personages or institutions. Um, O.W. Wilson was such a person many years ago who had great prestige, didn't have necessarily science behind him, but considerable uh, experience as a manager and prestige. Of course, law and bureaucracy uh, are intended to govern uh, what police should do. And uh, politics, both the inappropriate and the appropriate kind, are uh, in that. Um, Keep in mind that the advocates of evidence-based policing are not just calling on a little bit more science, a little bit more research, but they're, they're calling for a fundamental reorientation of how police organizations go about deciding to do their work. So becoming an evidence-based police department um, is a very consequential thing. Um, I'm not going to discuss the issue of whether you should go down the road. Um, that certainly has been debated, is being debated. Here are some uh, essays I refer you to, they're in your, your handout, that, that give you some rather provocative arguments, uh, pro and con, in this, and I refer you uh, to them. I'm going to talk today about some of the challenges that will face you should you decide to go down that road. Um, I'm going to address my comments to what will be required of police agencies to move toward the evidence-based uh, model. And I really take as the launching point for my comments um, the really excellent and provocative um, essay that uh, David Weisberg and Peter Nehrud uh, presented, and it's in your uh, handouts as well, at the Harvard Executive Session. Um, they argue that an essential element for the success of evidence-based policing is that police must own police science. And David talked uh, at some length about that rather inspirationally. I guarantee you I'm not going to speak in inspirational terms, but as I said, get down in the weeds. And because uh, David already presented that, I'm not going to go down this list of things that, um, that really uh, are the outline of things that they talk about, uh, about what it means to, for the police to own uh, police science. Each of the items here could be the basis for a 50 minute, at least a 50 minute session on um, evidence-based policing. Um, today, I want to consider two practical questions that cut across all those. Uh, what does ownership require from uh, the leaders in a police organization? And what role should employees play 
uh, in this ownership transformation. Uh, to begin, I'd like to consider two different ownership models. The first is the stockholder model, and this is essentially uh, where the owners uh, of, of a, a corporation or an organization buy stocks and reap the rewards, the rewards um, which can, may come in the form of dividends, interest, capital gains, and so on. Um, but their responsibilities do not extend to managing the organization. They hire managers to do that. Right now, I'd say that in most police departments in America, this is the model that dominates. That is, the, the police pay the price for the research and they reap the rewards in terms of the information gained. But by and large, researchers themselves figure out what kind of research will be done and how it should be done. You've heard some exceptions to that today. I would regard those as likely the exceptions. Then there's the second model, which is more common in small businesses, which is the um, owner-manager model. And this is where the people who own the business also make the management decisions. Um, they uh, play not the passive role of the stockholder, but the active role of the manager as well as the owner. And I think that, uh, we'll find out if they agree, but I think that this is the appropriate model to pursue if you're going to get serious about going down the evidence-based road. Um, and what I want to argue here is that if you go down that road and use the small business model, that you, may, you will also want to um, opt for the high employee participation version. And you just, in the preceding presentation, heard reasons for that. And I'll talk about different crazy ideas I have about how that, uh, you might help make that work. Uh, today, I'll discuss three key ownership responsibilities for police leaders. Developing a research agenda, deciding how to do the research, and making use of the research results. And I'll take them one at a time. So first with developing a research agenda. This is the key to ownership. This should become an integral part of the department's strategic planning. There are many questions that police leaders would like to see researched, I'm sure, and the challenge is picking among them and establishing priorities. You might have an incredibly long laundry list, but you've got to start somewhere and you can't do everything. There are always pressing local issues that pop up unexpectedly, and they, of course, need tending. But there are also enduring questions of the sort that David was talking about that get at the core of the department's mission, and that's important. Now, what often happens is that the research agenda of a police organization is reactively driven. It's either because people like, like I come to you with a really, what we think, nifty research idea, and we persuade you that we won't do too much harm in your organization, we might even help out a little bit, and you do that. So you react in that way, or perhaps it's reactive because some issue pops up that you're not sure what the right answer is, and you decide to do a little investigation on your own. Um, the focus on the research can vary in your research agenda. Many evidence-based advocates uh, focus on evaluating the impact of well-defined programs and strategies, and we've heard a lot about that today. But proactive policing can be used for other purposes, to scan for problems, for example. For example, if police chiefs are becoming concerned about the impact of stress on police officers, they might, start to, they might want to commission a, a simple kind of study, a diagnostic survey of their department to see just how much of a problem is that in my organization. I'm a member of the National Police Research Platform, which is a project funded by NIJ. And in this platform, as part of this, this project, we did a comparison of a dozen different departments on this issue and found great variation in the level of emotional burnout uh, among those police departments. We had, uh, and when I say emotional burnout, this is somebody who was reporting uh, being emotionally burned out at least one day a week. And many of them were much more frequently that daily. Um, the, the rate was interesting. It was as low as 5% of the officers saying, that's not too bad. I mean, in fact, that might be a pretty nice place to work. But the high end was 45%. Now, if I were the chief of that organization, I would want to know why my organization is leading the pack, right? Now, I, this research does not answer the question of what to do about it, but it lets you know if you have a problem. And if you do it right, you might have some idea of where to look, what kinds of solutions to look for that then you could test uh, using the kinds of methods 
uh, that David has uh, laid out so elegantly. Science can also be used to learn more about a problem that you know you have. When gang violence flared up in Boston, police researchers engaged in research to learn what the likely sources of that violence were. And that research, in turn, served as the basis for the widely touted pulling levers strategy that they developed. Now, a third item in developing the research agenda is figuring out who gets to participate in that process. And the best answer will no doubt vary with the circumstances. We all know, or most of us believe, that wider participation in a project early on is a good way to get buy-in down the road when, you fig when the project figures out where you want to go. But of course, if participation becomes too wide, it becomes disruptive uh, and unwieldy. So I recommend, particularly for larger departments, a two-stage two process uh, of developing a research agenda where you might have a small task force that works on what an agenda is. Now, I'm not talking about a project, but a series of projects. The membership of that agenda, I think, could, should have at least three kinds of people in it. Number one, people who have a good grasp and appreciation of top management's priorities and values. Second, it should include those who represent a variety of different perspectives within the agency. We all know that all police are not alike. In fact, they are very different, and it's important to get input from a variety of people at this stage. And finally, uh, those who have a strong grounding in police research and scientific methods. In addition, the department might want to bring in community leaders, something that James was talking about in his uh, vision of what uh, CompStat might become. And finally, in some cases, in fact in many cases, you might decide that you want to bring in other police departments to collaborate. For example, many departments these days are faced with the challenges of doing more with fewer resources. And departments are each going about the business somewhat differently. Some may be strikingly differently. Some may cut back on special units. Some may be bold enough to cut back a little bit on the calls for service. It just consumes a huge amount of the organization's resources. And others might be grabbing on to what should be more cost-efficient technology. Well, a collaborative project would enable you to learn by the natural variation that's occurring out there and get some idea of the consequences of going down those different roads. The next major, major leadership responsibility is to make decisions about research methods. Uh, in the past, police leaders have left these decisions mostly to outside research specialists, and I think that Nehru and Weisberg make it very clear that you've got to hop up there in the driver's seat here. Uh, at least sit beside the researcher, not in the back seat. Why? Because there are, if for no other reason, there are very practical implications for the kinds of decisions that research methods call for. There are three common issues. There are often things that have to be weighed against each other. And here are three common issues. Evidence-based advocates have argued, as David did quite eloquently, that we need more rigorous research so we can know with greater confidence what works and what doesn't. Now, that may be so. But your department is deciding what is good for the department. Selecting the most rigorous study may not always be the best option. There are a couple reasons for that. First is the financial cost and disruptiveness of the research to the organizational routines. More scientific, the more rigorous the scientific study usually, the more costly and the more disruptive it is. Ideally, you would always select, if you could, the most rigorous project, but sometimes you can't. You might want to buy a Cadillac, but you might have the budget for a Chevy. And you better decide, as David said, is that Chevy going to give you what you want? Because if it isn't, don't buy it at all. Wait until you can afford the Cadillac. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say that I don't think it's always a linear relationship between quality and design. No, it's not. Sometimes uh, the best design could not be that costly. Indeed, not more costly. In some sense, uh, though there were departmental resources that may have done, the cost was very small relative to uh, there, there, are, uh, there are experiments that cost a great deal. There are, there are non-experiments, conservative research, 
the survey the, shows close to hundred dollars a person these days. So if you do a survey of ten thousand people, get some thoughts of the, the cost. So that it's not always a limited edition. However, obviously, when you want to do things better, there is some cost. Involved. Right, and so you have to decide if you can afford to do it and what the likely payoff is. Um, and suppose that you wanted to do a study to test in your community, although there's now a fair amount of science on it that suggests that they don't produce the desired results, but suppose that you wanted to do that. You better think in advance of how you're going to sell that politically, because there are a lot of parents who want their kid in that program. And how are you going to tell them, well, we're randomly assigning this now. Not everybody gets it. So you have to think about that in advance. I think there are ways to deal with that, but it's a political issue. And it's better to be in front than behind on that issue. So scientific rigor, cost, ethics, and politics are all issues you need to grapple with. Um, the third and final ownership responsibility issue for leaders is um, figuring out what to do with the research results. One task that uh, should be accomplished before the study is even launched is planning for different research finding scenarios. What if the department results are good, what are you going to do? That is, the, that the program works. What if they're not so good? What if it doesn't work or what if it backfired? What, are you going to th what do you think you're going to say? Of course you can't lay it out in great detail because you don't know exactly what the research showed. But you should be thinking about these things in advance. Or how will disappointment and jealousies be dealt with if you're comparing the performance within the department of two different groups? And one group is shown to be superior in performance to the other. The need, you need to think about those things in advance. The second task is to figure out what to do when you actually have the research report in hand. Here there should be no surprises. The department needs a chance to review the research report before it's released publicly. So that includes reviewing it for factual errors. There should be a discussion somewhere in this process of the practical implications. Um, not just the chief contemplating it, but probably a group of people. And what issues and challenges will be raised by the report when the results are made known outside the department? It may be that you well need to, if you're the chief, telegraph this to others to whom you report or to some uh, stakeholders who would need to uh, be very interested in knowing the results. And you need, need to give yourself enough time to do all these things. And the final task is the dissemination plan. You ought to be thinking in advance of where it's going to go, how it's going to go, is it going to be presented to the media, and so on. Any evidence-based uh, department is responsible for making the results as widely available as possible, as soon as possible, if everyone is going to benefit from that. So far I've covered three um, uh, responsibilities for police leaders who want to engage in evidence-based policing. Now I'll turn to the role of police employees and that they could, should play in evidence-based policing. And there's no simple way to address this challenge. Um, it, it certainly varies. I wanted to begin by distinguishing five different roles that uh, police employees could play. The most common role is that police employees are the object of research. They're doing something that you're measuring in some way. May, they may not, may be an outcome measure, it may not be. It may be a treatment measure, an implementation measure, measure or whatnot. But they are part of what is being studied. And there are some concerns here that many of you are familiar with, but for those of you who haven't done a lot of research, particularly with university researchers or other research or organizations, you need to encourage employees to participate. That's obvious. But you have to do it in such a way that their fundamental right to accept or decline to participate without adverse consequence is maintained. And you need to take precautions to protect those research subjects. That usually means ensuring confidentiality or anonymity of the employees. And universities have to follow rather complicated rules about maintaining these sorts of human subjects protection standards. The second role for police employees is to provide expertise by generating ideas about what should be on the research agenda. And this could be done by forming employee task forces. Uh, but another way to do it is to, again, treat the, the, the employees as research subjects, but as experts, as people who have knowledge for you. And David may alluded to the importance of not ignoring what the craft of policing has to offer. In many cases, the development of interventions, or the understanding of how interventions may not work or may not be implemented, 
would be anticipated if researchers first took a look at what the craftspeople of policing want. So um, a lot's to be learned, for example, at the tactical level of how to handle domestic disputes, how to handle intoxicated people, juveniles and gangs, crowds, and even the plain old uh, ordinary and sometimes not so ordinary traffic stop. Uh, sometimes officers agree on these tactics, but often they, they use different ones. So there's natural variation in the approach that police officers use. Let me give you an example of how we uh, uh, try to take advantage of that in a project I'm working on with James and other colleagues at George Mason with the Manassas City Police Department. Um, we surveyed a large portion of the, de uh, the department's officers about patrol work and we asked them which kind of decision was most likely to produce undesirable results. And they chose between pairs of options where the uh, choices were too much of X or not enough of X. And as you can see, about 94% of the officers picked not enough information sources here as, uh, as opposed to too much. And if you take a look at the readings here, what you're really seeing is that the officers are saying that more often than not, adverse results happen when not enough time is taken, when not enough initiative is taken to diagnose a situation or to explain what the officers decided to do. So these are all time-consuming things. And you might say, well, well, yeah, I mean, obviously that, that's the case. The thing is that, of course, if that were the case, ever, you would do a lot of it. But there are pressures in policing not to spend forever. I've been with police officers who have spent six hours on one domestic dispute in a very busy di uh, beat, meaning that nobody else got service in that beat while she was doing that. Right? So there are trade-offs. And what this suggests to us is, is that um, this department might benefit by taking a look into uh, the trade-offs of pressure for snap decisions as opposed to pressure for, product, uh, for, for getting the job done right and quality. Um, employees can be mobilized a third way as problem solvers and I think that um, I don't need to go into that in great detail. Uh, there's an excellent case study on that, one of the early cases of problem solving uh, done by Hans Toke in which seven police officers formed a study group uh, to, to study violent police officers and see if there were ways to reduce unnecessary violence committed by police officers. And this was a really innovative process at the time, a really a model for what problem-oriented policing in the ideal case would be. And not only did the officers come up with a plan to do it, but they went on in the, in the next phase to actually conduct the research. They implemented the plan and evaluated it. And so that's, that's the next rule. Um, there are some upsides to that and some downsides. The upsides, um, those who are closest to the issue know the most about it and, and have great insight. You develop a cadre of people who are well informed about research and participation in all. Uh, uh, also, you get people who are committed to using the results. But the down, there are downsides, too, to using in-house researchers. One is that uh, it's difficult to be objective when you're evaluating, particularly if you're evaluating yourself. And even if you can be objective, whether it's yourself personally or your organization, others may not believe that you were objective. So there are benefits to having outsiders do part of, if not all of, uh, the research. Uh, it also can take a lot of staff time. It can, in that case, detract from other responsibilities. And sometimes you will lack in-house the expertise you need to do a proper job. So the adv best advice is to carefully evaluate in advance all these considerations and obviously customize the solution. The fifth and final role for police employees is that of using the research to make better decisions. And this will uh, be the most common role for employees. Um, really there are two things that you need to know, I think, about being a good user of research. What does the best evidence indicate about the decision I'm uh, about to make? Uh, and what are the limitations of this evidence? How much confidence should I have in it? Will it apply to my situation? Now, a great deal could be said about how to become effective users. I want to just talk about uh, a couple of things. Um, as Weisberg and Nehru argue, the Recruit Academy is a good, good place to um, introduce the best scientific evidence that is relevant to police. It would be valuable to expose recruits to what science, what science knows, the best evidence. Now, it would be remarkable if 
almost as much time were devoted to that as what the law tells you to do, what the department rules tell you to do, and what the war stories that really are a way of communicating the craft of policing. Now, I'm not saying that your best police officers are going to get A's in Dr. Weisberg's class. I mean, you have to have people who can go to domestic dispute and carry out what science says. But just knowing what science says, hopefully, if it's done in a, in a certain way, will help legitimize what's going on. The interesting thing is, though, that it can't stop at the academy. If you do that, guaranteed to fail. Because what happens? We all know they go out on the street, and the FTO, or the senior officer they're assigned to work with, or who in the group, or the supervisor says, oh, what's that? Right? They did not drink the Kool-Aid. Right? So you've got to give them doses of Kool-Aid too, or it will be wasted, absolutely wasted, time and again. It's one of the great fallacies of training. You train the people who are going to do the job and forget about everybody else. Don't do it. Um, ultimately, I think that if you go down the evidence-based road, you need to develop both short-term and long-term strategies. And, and I think one of the things you want to, to figure out is where are you, are you going to invest the bulk of your resources and when? I think you need both short-term and long-term strategies. Um, and you have a couple of choices here. And I, you know, this, th this is the part that I absolutely, you know, it's, it's very projective. I, I don't know the answer, but I have a gut feeling that you have two options. Ideally, you can do a bit of both. One is create new knowledge. A lot of what David was talking about is in the, the, in the path of creating new knowledge. Very important. By the same token, what Larry Sherman tells us um, uh, in the field of medicine, and which we also know in policing, is that a lot of interesting and useful science is wasted. That is, it isn't used. And so you have to create a positive user environment. Of the two things, I think it's easier, actually, to create new knowledge than it is to change the user environment, to get people receptive to using it, to adopt it. You already heard several stories about the challenges there in doing that. Um, one of the ways I think that you can help inculcate that when you train police officers, oh, by the way, of course, one of the ways you can do it is to make sure that they all get a college education in a fine program like ours, right, where we teach all kinds of evidence-based uh, approaches. And I strongly recommend that you do that. I can, there's a lot of evidence in support of that. But the um, fact is, about one in three police departments, a survey that David did at the Police Foundation, National Service, found that about one in three police officers in, among the, not the really small, but the, the larger departments, um, has a college education. Now, not all of them are, have got a college education in social science and these methods, but um, so that's probably not the solution. You're going to have to do some training in your department if you want to create users. But I guarantee you again, well, it's speculation based, but in my experience, in the military at least, these one day, three day, five day modules and you're out do not work. Number one, that's an awful lot to jam into somebody's head about randomization and everything else measurement and so on. But the other thing is it needs to become, the training needs to be integrated into their everyday work. So that they get a training exercise and they have to take it home and do it. When I say home, I mean back to the department and do something in the department. And it needs to be continuous. That's how you will keep a cultural presence in your organization. Um, I've been neglecting my slides here. Um, okay. Everything I've presented today is focused on how to own the research that the evidence-based uh, policing requires. And I've suggested to you the owner-manager model is the, is the best way to go. It calls for a lot of police involvement and in, in, in effect what I'm suggesting, and I think, although Peter uh, may differ on this, that, that really they're suggesting that police Leaders need to become the senior partners in this relationship, certainly co-equal, not junior partners in the research, dis research process. Um, so everything I've said boils down to meeting two challenges presented by evidence-based policing. How police can become a more active partner in the production of scientific knowledge and how police can be become more effective users. However you decide to resolve these, these uh, issues, I think it would be valuable if your departments began to systematically record your experiences with this evidence-based process. 
so that we don't have faculty like me or uh, people giving anecdotes, case stories, but you begin to develop a knowledge base on an evidence base, if you will, on evidence-based policing. And one of the ways you could do this is to form a consortium. Now, in fact, this has been done in Britain, and uh, Peter may, be talk may talk a bit about that. And that might be one useful model. It could be a national organization, or it could be a capital region in Northern Virginia or Maryland or whatever model. But I think that that might be a useful way for people to go on this. And that will be my last suggestion. <laughs>